And we don't have speakers. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Is it showing up back there, brother? All right, well, bless God. Down on chapter 3. Um, hopefully, Lord willing, we, this is a pretty straight, straightforward chapter. Uh, we have had messages out of this chapter before. I think the last message we preached out of this was called Through the Fire. How God will be with you through the fire. Not only can He take you through the fire, but you can come out with not even a smell of smoke yeah. on your clothes. And it happened here. Yeah. It happened here. And these guys had faith. And it, it's also a picture you can see, you know, like uh, Brother Kent was explain a little bit Sunday morning how Ezekiel, you've got prophecies that are taking place and you've got prophecies that will apply later on because we know that the things that are is that which shall be. And and the same demand that's put on the people, the nations. He invites the, the, everybody to Babylon had total control of the world as, as we know it, the world that, that counted for anything at that time. And he ordered them all to come and worship this image. Same thing in Revelation 13 verses 14 and 15 that the, be, that the false prophet it does and if you don't worship that image you too will be killed and that was the same decree given here with the help of the spirit of truth book of Daniel chapter 3 beginning in verse 1 Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon you got to understand beloved this is a massive statue it's probably about 90 foot a little over 90 foot tall uh, huge at the base uh, brother Kent was telling me earlier that they they're pretty sure they found the foundation that that thing stood on it's uh, round round in nature an image in Babylon from ancient ruins archaeological digs in Babylon in particular an image was generally considered in the form of a man so it doesn't particularly say it but I can kind of deduce the fact that King Nebuchadnezzar made a statue of himself and the people that wouldn't worship it was going to be put to death and the same thing we're told about the false prophet he made an image to the beast that was and was not that had a wound up by the sword but lived so it is probably an image of a man as well and he gives power to that image that it would speak and anybody that does not worship that image as well is to be put to death so you can see things reminiscent of the book of revelation right here in the, in the book of Ch uh, Daniel the, the same thing taking place verse uh, verse 2 then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather, listen now, the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces. Important there, the provinces, is because that would be your outpost. That would be every, everywhere that, that Nebuchadnezzar had his thumb, even, even outside of his immediate land, even, even all them. So in other words, we could look at it in the New Testament version, word, what the the false prophet is going to do it, it, it could be a, a picture of worldwide uh, worship of another god and he says that he, he, he ordered them to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, listen, O people, nations and languages. So he's obviously talking about folks outside of his own immediate scope. He's talking about other languages. You had to come in and pay your money to him. He's talking about bringing the, the, the leaders, the upper echelons, the, the enforcers of the law, the princes, people from all nations coming down to worship this image. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, and the counselors, and all, they come down for the dedication that Nebuchadnezzar, verse 3, said the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So they're here ready, ready standing before this image. Verse 4 says, Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. Listen now. 
ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same air be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Instantly. Not, not later, but instantly. And I, I told you it reminds me of that, of the worship that the false prophet is going to have set up. Revelation 13, stay where you're at. The same, the same scenario we see. Speaking of the false prophet, it says, He doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Who, do, who else does that? Elijah. So th these men are going to be imitating things. That's why I said it is very important that we trust in the finished canon, not secret books, not secret secret revelations as people were getting, not visions, not dreams. We have the finished canon. The Bible is finished. The Bible is finished for a reason. We have the pre preserved Word of God. Anything extra biblical is just that. It's extra biblical. We know this is Holy Spirit inspired truth. Now if anything outside the Word of God lines up with the Word of God, there's nothing wrong with that. Line, line it up. But when it's contradictory to what we have, we know it to be false. We know it to be a lie. And he says in verse 14 that he doeth, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. So, and he said he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Same thing Nebuchadnezzar wanted. And he says it's the people that dwell on the earth, the whole earth. And we know that the whole earth, whosoever's name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, whosoever is not of the Jewish bloodline that are sealed in Revelation chapter 7 to carry out God's work, anybody else can and, and, and is probably going to be deceived because he said those that dwell on the earth pretty much making it a unanimous thing. Well, we know that we're not going to be deceived because we're not of the night. We're of the day. We're the children of the light. We see the truth. So the restrainer, when he is removed, when we're removed, it's going to get bad on planet Earth. And people are going to believe the lies. People are going to believe the lies. And just like right here, they're willfully going to fall down and, and, and worship inanimate objects. And even the false prophet is going to, he's going to have the power after, like Satan. He's going to make it talk. He's going to make it talk. We went to the museum down there, and I sent pictures of, to Brother Kent poking fun at him because he's a big Roll Tide fan, and I've been to the Alabama Museum about four times now. And, and, and I took pictures of it and said, For you, Brother Kent, ha, because I'm at the Alabama Museum, the Bear Bryant Museum. But the one thing that jumped out at me, and I wouldn't even go over there, is when you're walking in the front entrance to Bryant Denny Stadium, you got statues of people setting up. They're not battle heroes, they're not Confederate soldiers that died for their land died for their nation it's football coaches and they rich godlike statuses to people and if you don't believe me go to one of those games and get in a crowd of people that's cheering for whichever team and holler for the other team and see how you fare they'll kill you over it's passionate it's a big thing they put, they're way too serious about it and it's borderline idolatry. It's borderline idolatry. Saban's a great coach. He don't need a statue. Bryant was a good coach. The man's dead. He don't need a statue. You don't need statues of men because you're teaching kids to look at those images and those things. Like we're, make, we're breaking them in and getting them used to the ideal that that's normal. That that's not normal. Verse 7 of Daniel chapter 4. It says, Therefore, at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, listen, the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Obviously, we've got people other than the Chaldeans. We've got people other than the Babylonians worshipping. This is, this is worship on a global, if you will, scale. All the nations, all the rulers from them, all, all those nations. They're, they're enforcers of the law. They're magistrates. Everybody we would see downtown in the courthouse today, they're all lined up leading their people to bow down and worship this false god. 
Verse 8 says, Wherefore at that time certain of the Chaldeans, they came near and they accused the Jews. Probably out of jealousy because what happened? The Jews bypassed them, right? God lifted them up to a place of prominence. Uh, Daniel gave the interpretation and the dream to Nebuchadnezzar and then he said, I want my buddies with me. So they, he gets Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego with him and they're over the affairs. They're over the provinces of Babylon. They have raised themselves up to high status. They haven't. God has. And the other people are jealous, no doubt. And they want to see those Jews sat down. And so these Jews will not fall down and worship a false god. These particular Jews. And it enrages them. They say, here's our chance. Just like with Christ when the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they followed him around everywhere he went. Not because they loved him. Not because they liked his teaching. But so that they might catch him slipping up in something that he did or said. So that they could have something on him to kill him. They said, these Jews, they said to the king, verse 9, they spake and said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, has made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psalter, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. He's, and then they go on to say in verse 12 that there are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. As I was saying earlier, they've got positions of authority. He said, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he said, these men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Amen. Amen. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before for the king. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Now listen, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, and watch this. This is no different today. You, you can get captured by you can you can get captured by Muslims, and if you'll deny your Christ, you can live. They, they will give you the opportunity to because they're after your eternal soul. Satan wants your eternal soul, so he wants you to deny your Savior. And they've got a way out right here, but it comes at a cost. He wants them denying their God and falling down and worshiping another God. He says, verse 15, now if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psalter, and the dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made, he says, well. But if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. You, or and who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? He says, in essence, in layman's terms, he says, deny or die because you don't have to openly deny but when you go to another altar and you fall down and worship another altar you have denied your God and that's what he's given them the opportunity to do hey I'll let you go but you must fall down and worship me. Same thing Satan told Christ in the wilderness when he was tempting him. Hey, I've been given power over all these things and I'll give them to you but you fall down and worship me you fall down to worship me. Satan wants worship. Satan wants that he thinks he's a god and he wants that worship. And then they spake, or wherefore at, at that certain time, verse 8, Chaldeans came near and they accused the Jews. And they, I jump, I'm, I'm in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. In other words, they weren't necessarily being cocky per se but they said we're not careful I mean in other words you know what we're, we're, we're not worried about it we, we don't have to think about the answer to your request we don't have to give it any thought it'd be like somebody coming up to us and saying look you deny Jesus and I'll give you a million dollars I'll let you live and he's like man that goes without thinking we, we deny our Christ we're not bowing down not for the dollar not for our lives we're not, we're not going to deny Christ that's what they said. We don't have to. We don't have to worry. We're not careful. Meaning, meaning there is nothing. We're we're not going to take any thought. We got an answer for you right now. Verse seventeen. They say, if it be so, 
Or in other words, Lord willing, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set forth. They said, our God is able to deliver us from it. But you know what? If it's not his will... We still ain't falling down and worshiping your image, and we ain't going to worship your false gods. Either way, God, they said we, God is able to deliver us. They had great faith. And you know what? Even though they had great faith, they was also courageous because they, they said, hey, even if he don't, even if he don't, you know, paraphrasing, they didn't say this, but you can imagine it. We know who our God is. We know who our God is. And we're not falling down to no statue and we're not falling down to gods that don't exist. We're not denying our God. We'll take our chances, is what they were saying. Great faith. Then, verse 19, was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or in other words, he was looking at them different now. He had a different look on them. You know, because he had raised them up and sent them over there with Daniel to be in positions over the provinces of Babylon. But now, since they wouldn't worship his image and his false gods, the way that he looked at them was swiftly changing. He had utter contempt for them now, and he loathed them. He was hating them because they wouldn't bow down and worship him. Same thing Satan's desiring today. He wants worship. He'll give people music contracts. He'll push all kinds of buttons on this world because he is the prince of the power there. He'll make things happen for your soul. For your soul. There's a lot of rock and roll groups that have given testimony that they made deals with the devil to become popular, to become rich, to become famous. It's a shame. Man. They opened up all the monasteries one time a year. The military personnel go in for free. You have to kiss the belly of the eye. I didn't go to you. Oh, yeah, I reckon not. That'd be one of them joints I wouldn't go to as well. Mm-mm-mm. Then, verse 19, Nebuchadnezzar, full of fury in the form of his visit, was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, he spake and he commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Now, this furnace, beloved, from best they could tell from archaeological ruins in the way that not only the Babylonians would build a kiln or a furnace, but a lot of people, and even today, it would be probably in a conical shape, like a cone, and it, it would come up probably like a tunnel, and the fuel would be down at the bottom where they would stoke up the flames, stoke up the fire. The fuel would be down at the bottom. So you've got this natural updraft vent. And this booger was hot. It made, made, a, made a lot of heat. In so much so as we see, verse 20 says, He commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. He said, Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments. He was putting combustibles on them too. Not like the furnace wasn't hot enough. He was going to put something on them to help catch them on fire. I mean, you would ins instantly be disintegrated more, more than likely. And he said in verse 22, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, in other words, they really stoked this fire up. They got carried away. They was throwing fuel at it fast. And this furnace was extremely hot. And y'all been around a furnace or around a fire, a bonfire when it takes off and you got a, whew, you know, you've really got the heat coming off of it. It's rising up and you can't get near it because of the heat that it's putting out. This is a furnace built like that with the heat coming up. And it was so hot that verse 22 says the flame, the latter part of verse 22, 22 says, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they were obviously leading them up there. They were bound, and the mighty men, the baddest ones that Babylon had, was carrying Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego up there to the top, probably to the, to the top of a ridge, looking down into the furnace, and the sheer heat caused the mightiest men to literally... They might have burnt up before they hit it, but they fell down inside the furnace. They couldn't get close enough. The heat was so bad it probably suffocated them. They was probably asphyxiated. Down into the furnace they went. And I'm sure they was instantly, in fact, just burned away, incinerated. And... 
He says in verse 23, And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they didn't have anybody holding them by the arms anymore because they were bound, they fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. So off they went. The mighty men, they, they, they got probably incinerated by the fire. And then here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they just naturally, they fall right down on into the hole because there's nobody holding them up. And when this happened, they were probably off guard. They were probably getting drugged anyway. Down into the furnace they go. Verse 24, then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and he rose up in haste, and he spake and said unto his counselors, did, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, true, O king. He answered and said, lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like... The Son of God. And, 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 and God will never, even wherever you're at, even wherever you're at. Uh, Ken was making a statement to me the other, the other day when I was over there at his house. You know, no matter no matter where he's been and what predicament he's found himself in, he knew God was there too. He knew God was there with him, right? And, and, and wherever you're at in, in your most... Your weakest hour or your biggest time of need or, or in your biggest accomplishments, God is there with you. He dwells in us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's his promise. So these men, the Son of God, said he had a vision. Or he, had, he looked like the form of the Son of God. Now, Proverbs said, you know, do, do you know who the Lord is and, and you could, can you tell me his son's name? All through the scriptures, the son is alluded to. Uh, was this a pre-incarnate vision of Christ? Possibly so. M -m More than likely so. And he goes in there and they're dancing around in this fire. Can you imagine Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Because even with great faith, they probably was a little bit, had some butterflies. Because even people that love the Lord, you've got family members. You, we don't know, we're not told about their, they were still young here. They had some age passed. They had moved up. They were probably no longer Charlie's age and moved on up. They were, they were probably entering their formidable years. But they might have had family. They might not. They was probably a lot of things running through their mind. But even so, they were willing to either let God do a miracle through them or they were willing to die for God. It was not going to change their outlook on God. Amen. And I just think that is awesome. Verse 26 said, Then Nebuchadnezzar came. He came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and he spake. And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, the governors, and the captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power, nor was a hair on their head singed. Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire passed on them. Bless God, they had went through the fire, and not even the smell of smoke was on their clothes. 28 says, Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that, key phrase, trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies, that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. Therefore, he says, I make a decree. Now, remember, after Daniel had already given him the vision and the interpretation of his dream earlier, Nebuchadnezzar made a similar profession, didn't he? What God is there like this? There's no God like that that can tell a dream and give the interpretations thereof. Here he says it again, the same thing. And even after he saw Daniel give him the dream and the interpretation of the dream, he still sets up an image of gold, wanting to be worshipped like a God. And here he makes the same similar statement. No God like their God. He says, and yield their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any God except their own God. In verse 29, therefore I'll make a decree that every people 
nation, and language. So that covers a broad spectrum. Babylon had a control over, over well, basically what would have been the world at that time. He said, I'll make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill. Because here, look at this. There is no other God that can deliver after this sword. Now, a lot of people say, well, Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, that was his profession of faith. Now, whatever. The faith comes through the blood of Christ Jesus. The demons believed. The demons knew who Christ was. The demons, the devils, they recognized him all through the New Testament, but they were never saved. But they told him who he was. They recognized him when, when his own brethren couldn't recognize him. They knew who he was, but that didn't make them saved. Nebuchadnezzar has made two proclamations that he is the God and there's none other like him. But to me, that don't convince me that Nebuchadnezzar had a born-again experience because that comes through the blood of Christ Jesus. I, I, don't, I don't know what happened to the man in his latter days. I don't know where he stood in his heart. Hey, God can save anybody. I'd, I'd like to believe that the man got saved, but he, there's, there's proof and evidences that he carried on with his idolatry and with his false gods on, on, up, on up past his time. Verse 30, then here we go again. Look, look, what, look what the men got. His visage had changed. He had looked upon them with fury. He threw them in the fiery furnace. They had already been raised up to a level to where they was over different provinces of, ba of Babylon, kind of like Joseph was. They, had, they was in control of their, their own stations. But in verse 30 it says, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So not only did the king change his mind now, he pulls them out of the fire and he promotes them again. He raises them up even higher. The men that was just burning in the fiery furnace are he hoped. Now he's exalted them even to, a, to another position of prominence and gave them even more power. Chapter 4, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar the king, unto all the people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. He said, look, I think you need to know about this God. I thought it good that you should, that you should know what he has done and what he has shown unto me. Verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Who told him that? Who told him that? How did he know? How did he know that his kingdom, his dominion is forever and that his, his dominion is from generation to generation? He got revealed that truth. He knew that he had been in the presence of something that he had never been in the presence of before. You don't get thrown down in a fiery furnace and then walk around in that fiery furnace and come out without even the smell of smoke on your clothes unless there has been obviously a miracle taking place. That miracle would be God and his power and his promise to be with you even through the fire, Psalm 34 says. Even through the fire, God is able to take you to the other side. If you, if you believe him. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, they, show, they showed examples of that faith. Hey, kill us if you will. We ain't bowing down. Our God's got power to deliver us. And that faith in God and that opportunity for God to be glorified, God took that opportunity to be glorified. God will do the same things in our lives. When things look hopeless, when things look in despair, when things look like all odds, you should throw on the towel. If you stand fast and have faith in God and don't expect, don't demand, but say he is able to if he so chooses, but not my will, God's will, but I still ain't falling down. I still ain't selling my soul. I still ain't worshiping you, God. I still ain't going to worship the money. I'm going to follow God. And he's able, if he's willing, to save us out of any circumstance that comes along. And he will receive glory from that. Verse 4 says, Nebuchadnezzar was in his house, or, or was at rest in mine house, and flourishing in my palace. And he says, I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. 
Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Now you wonder at this point why he keeps calling in all the wise men and why don't he don't just go on to Daniel and bring him up and get the interpretation of his vision. You, you think, how much, how, much, how much does it take, O king? He's done men told a dream and the interpretation of the dream. He's done seen men thrown in a fiery furnace and God delivered them out of them. He's already declared God to be the God of gods and that his generation, that his dominion is from generation to generation. And yet, yet, he's still calling on the soothsayers. He's still calling on the wise men to get the answers. Do we do that in our lives? We know God is God. We know Christ died for our sins, but how much do we still grab a crutch instead of just trusting in what we have seen and believed? For, 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 it, for, every, for every time we do that, we take steps backwards. We take steps backwards in our walk. Because you're, you're telling God, yeah, I believe you, I don't know who you are. Now, I, I believe you, I know Christ has died for my sins, but... I still think there's there's got to be another way. Maybe you won't answer me on this. Don't ever show the Lord a lack of faith. You, what you can receive, what you can experience on this earth, this is not that off-the-wall preaching and teaching. If you will receive it, the power is there to be as good as you want to be for Him. The power is there to be as strong in your faith as you want to be. The power is there for great and mighty things to be done in your life. If you'll just... Show that faith in your actions and, and, in, and in your dealings with the Father. And when the Father puts something on you that looks impossible, it looks impossible, look past the problem, the provision is great. There's nothing that God cannot do. Is God out of the miracle business? I, I dare say not. You, you can't see that tornado that rode through Oklahoma City and the death toll number go down instead of rise overnight. That's unheard of. That's great mercy, great restraint that he showed to Oklahoma City. And to me, great love. And it was a miracle. It was a miracle. That tornado was on the ground for 45 minutes, covered a 20-mile span, leveled everything in its path, and 20-some-odd people, God rest their souls, lost their lives. But look at the countless thousands that could have been killed. But God spared them. Verse 7, then came in the magician. No, no, what? How does God look on magicians and astrologers and soothsayers? As abominations. As abominations. Because we're calling on them to get the answers to our future when we have the past, present, and future preserved for us right in front of us. We're holding it in our hands. You don't need magicians, astrologers, soothsayers, Ouija boards, or none of that satanic stuff. You don't need any of that. Matter of fact, every time we rely on another source, even something simple. If I catch a cold, I pray to God that it'll heal me. Sometimes you got to go get medical help. But what did I do? I broke down in my faith. I broke down in my faith and I went and got medical help. Not that I'm again doctors. I believe God gives doctors the skill that they have and the knowledge that they have to help us, to make us better. God works through doctors. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if my faith was where it needed to be all the time, I would trust on Him completely and 100% and the things that He's given us in His own garden and His own work, the things that are out there, I'd be healed up a whole lot faster if I put my faith solely in Him and trusted Him and, and had His will done in my life. Y'all agree? I believe it. I show, I show like a faith when I say, oh, I'm hurting, I'm, I'm panicking, get me something. I, I need to have something. I'm going to die here. I mean, if it's just give it to God and trust Him and call on Him and say, Lord, I know, I know that you, that you can, and in Jesus' name, you will take care of me and take care of anything that comes along. But the magicians... The astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And I told them the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation. Do you think that surprised him? But at last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods 
is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Tell me the vision of my dream that I have seen, and the interpretation thereof. Thus were the visions of mine head in my bed. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. The tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it, the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the bowls thereof, and all flesh was fed of it. I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher, and an holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Hew down the tree, and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves, and scatter his fruit. Let the beast get away from under it, and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and his roots in the earth, even with the band of iron and brass, in the tender grass of the field. And let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from man's, and let a beast heart be given unto him. Him, and let seven times or seven years pass over him. This matter is by decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the bestest of men. This dream I Nebuchadnezzar have seen. Now thou, O Belshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation but thou art able for the spirit of the holy gods now what she just would be singing her the holy god is in thee now I want to stop there I want you to read ahead I want you to meditate upon that vision that, that Nebuchadnezzar and if any of you had the guess to say right now what did the vision pertain to Amen. Y'all, y'all, y'all know that. Those of you that are schooled, you, you, you know that. And it's going to last for seven years. Because as you see, King Nebuchadnezzar, once again, even though he knows God is God, he's the most high, he's lifted up again. Because right before this, this vision is, becomes a reality, and he is struck and down, he has got himself lifted up on a high pedestal talking about what all he's done. I've done this, and I have done this, and look how great I am, and look how, what a king I am. Right before this comes into effect. So the vision is given, the vision is set, he has just told it to Daniel, and Lord willing, next week we're going to pick up right here in verse 19, and we'll break down the rest of that passage. So it's Daniel 3, verses 1 through uh, Daniel 4, verse 18, and we'll stop there, and I hope you got questions or comments to that.